Thanks again for your attention. I think all speakers appreci uh, really appreciate to, to have been in front of such a, an audience. I wanted to tell a few words uh, about healthcare innovation uh, and the challenge of regulation. As you know, um, the, well, the, my first point is to remind you how big how, um, the healthcare market is. As you see with those figures, in four uh, developed Western countries, you, you see the, um, the amount of um, health expenditure, both private and public, as a proportion uh, of GDP. So, as you see in the UK, in Germany, and in France, it's between 10% and 12%. In the US, the country where we spend the most in healthcare, it's almost 20%, actually uh, 18%. So, that represents a very big market and a lot of money, and that money could help fuel innovation uh, or could be uh, used by entrepreneurs to, to drive innovation in the healthcare industry. Uh, the problem uh, with innovation, the problem that uh, entrepreneurs front uh, uh, meet uh, when they try to disrupt the healthcare industry is obviously the tough regulations that are in place to mainly to protect the consumers. Uh, those regulations uh, are based on the social insurance systems such as uh, l'assurance maladie which is our social insurance for healthcare here in France or they're based on uh, uh, protecting uh, the consumers against adverse effects uh, of drugs when they're provided with them, such as the FDA in the US. Uh, it's the FDA's mission to protect uh, US citizens against excess, uh, against the potential dangers of um, drugs. So tough regulations when it comes to financing healthcare through social insurance, tough regulations when it comes to providing drugs and treatments. Um, so why th those rules? There's a, t there's a tendency those days to criticize rules and to call for deregulations everywhere, but we always have to remind ourselves why those regulations were put in place uh, originally, and that was mainly for very good reasons. In healthcare, there is a, a lot of regulations because first, health is a, a matter of life and death. You cannot experiment uh, with the lives of patients. You cannot do uh, anything with the lives of patients because it's a matter of life and death. And obviously, um, it's harder to innovate when you cannot experiment in real life uh, and you have to do it in the lab. Uh, the second issue is that people are willing to pay anything for healthcare. That's a very important fact and that's a key to understand why healthcare uh, works that way and why the Americans spend 20% of their GDP in healthcare. That's because when you ill when you're facing potential death or handicap, you are really willing to, to, to spend anything. And those providing healthcare know that and don't hesitate to raise the prices, uh, uh, knowing that you will pay any price if uh, the stake is to save your life. So that's why we, uh, prices are regulated uh, and put, uh, partially paid for by social insurance. And the third reason why healthcare uh, is highly regulated, it's because it's a major factor of growing inequalities. Um, when faced with disease, uh, the poor and the rich and the middle class are very uh, are in very different situations. Rich people can pay anything to be taken care of and treated the right way, while poor people cannot afford uh, what it costs to treat them when they have a disease. And so, uh, when there's no regulation, uh, suddenly a lot of people can go bankrupt when they're ill because they have to pay for very, uh, very expensive treatments, whereas the rich people get richer and richer and are cured uh, appropriately. So those are the very good reasons and, and the sustained reasons why there are tough regulations in healthcare. But that, those regulations are a problem when they bar 
entrepreneurs from entering the market because um, you cannot innovate at the margin, especially uh, in the digital economy where innovation is always driven by network effects and large scale of operations. All innovation in the digital economy uh, triumphs uh, only when it can reach a large scale because you have to serve millions of people to, to achieve network effects and to beat the market and to beat the incumbents on the market. So when you uh, are only allowed to innovate at the margin, you cannot reach the scale of operations of such large companies um, like Google or like Facebook or like Amazon. You are condemned to serve the high-end market. So if you reach people that are willing to pay for your not so efficient innovation because it it's costs too, too much money. So, the, the solution obviously is not to uh, repeal all regulations and to transform the healthcare market into a jungle where only the rich people will be cured, obviously. So, that would basically kill innovation because you, uh, you, you could only raise capital to serve rich people and th because this isn't a large market, then no one would invest in your uh, disruptive technologies or disruptive experiences. So we don't have to repair, repeal all regulations. We only have to upgrade them and to adapt them to the new state of affairs, the current state of affairs, which is that the digital, digital technologies are really changing everything. So that's why Edmund Phelps, uh, Nobel Prize in Economics, wrote in a very inspiring book published in 2012 called Mass Flourishing. Mass Flourishing is about mass innovation, as you see, and he reminds us that uh, innovation is not about science, it's not about research, it's about reaching out to the consumers and transforming markets. And, so, and for that, you need economic, what he calls economic dynamism, the desire to innovate, so that's a desire expressed by entrepreneurs and they are here and they've proven all day that they're really willing to innovate. But you also need the space uh, to innovate and the space doesn't exist if regulations are fixed and won't be upgraded to fit the current state of affairs. So. There's hope anyway, and I see three trends that prove that you can upgrade regulations to enable innovation in the healthcare industry. The first trend is quite old. It's uh, what those, all those activists did in the 80s and in the 90s to force the government to change the rules, to accelerate the pace of research and to learn how to cure the people uh, who, who had AIDS. So ACT UP is one of the uh, most renowned organizations. It was really created as, as a very tough activist organization to, f to, to demonstrate against the government, to demonstrate especially in the US against the FDA and to force the FDA to enable new uh, drugs and new treatments that, uh, without taking too much time because people were dying. And so ACT UP was really the patients themselves pushing for upgrading regulations so that they could obtain innovation and new treatments. And that was um, turned into a movie last year called Dallas Buyers Club with Matthew McConaughey on the right and Jared Leto on the left. Both won Oscars last, uh, a few months ago for their exceptional performance in that film where uh, basically um, a uh, a cowboy in Texas, in Dallas, uh, suddenly discovering that he's, he has AIDS, uh, is forced to go to Mexico to buy illegal drugs and to, uh, to, 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 to take them back to the US. And he turns that into an Ill illegal business and he, uh, found himself, he finds himself fighting against the FDA so that uh, people with AIDS in Dallas could obtain a, a proper treatment and a few months, uh, a few more months to leave. So the second trend is what's ha currently happening in emerging country, countries. Sorry, uh, 
emerging countries have a chance they don't have a proper uh, an old a legacy healthcare system uh, they didn't they didn't create social insurances like we did in the 20th century and they don't have the proper uh, performance infrastructures to cure everyone so they can innovate because when you you have nothing you're not constrained by existing uh, companies by existing institutions by existing social insurances and you can innovate by uh, through the creation of new ways to take care of patients, of new treatments, of new experiences to take care of your health. And so, this is Jim Yonkin, he's uh, the chairman of the World Bank, and he, but before that he was um, um, a scholar specialized in, uh, in healthcare in, in poor countries, and he was the founder of a, of, of a very interesting and inspiring organization called Partners in Health, uh, and with partner in health, uh, those guys pioneered uh, uh, truly innovative ways to cure people in poor countries. Um, on, your, on, your, on, on the right, there's uh, an experiment uh, by a company called Medtronic that was in India uh, called Healthy Heart for All. It was uh, designed by a, a consulting company called InnoSight, uh, funded um, by Clay Clayton Christensen. And uh, they designed an, a non-profit effort to, to bring a treatment to people that, were, that had heart disease at a very large scale to open the market for new treatments. Um, and they could do that in India because there was no constraints and there was no regulations barring new ways to, to cure people. And the third trend, and it's very important, is uh, the deployment of the new American healthcare system called Obamacare. Here you have the historic signature by President Obama of that bill that was uh, enacted by Congress in 2012 in exceptional cir circumstances. It's a bill, it's an act uh, that, have, uh, th that had since to, to, uh, to fight many obstacles. Uh, it had to be, uh, to be advocated for uh, in the Supreme Court. Then Barack Obama had to win a second term to make sure that uh, uh, this act would would remain, and then uh, and y there are still uh, pending cases in the Supreme Court that could endanger uh, Obamacare. Nevertheless, um, entrepreneurs and venture capitalists in the Silicon Valley have decided that there was a chance that it could work, that Obamacare would become a new platform to invent a new healthcare system for the US. And so at the time, because the US didn't have universal health coverage, uh, which was an anomaly in, uh, um, compared to other developed countries, suddenly in the US you have the room to innovate because you have this new platform, a new insurance system that enables entrepreneurs to enter the market and to provide new ways of curing people, of providing insurance they, they're really inventing in Silicon Valley and deploying a new way, a, a digital way to take care of patients after, uh, well, in the digital age. And so the Americans spent a lot in healthcare, but they were way behind us in terms of curing everyone because they didn't have universal press, press coverage. Now they're catching up very fast because suddenly they have that social insurance that changes everything, and they're inventing on top of this platform, thanks to entrepreneurs, thanks to uh, venture capitalists, a new healthcare system uh, fitting the needs of the digital age. So, who will win this fight to, to dominate the global healthcare industry? I think the Americans are way ahead of us because they're, they're not constrained by a legacy system. Um, we in, in Europe, um, some countries are trying to, to upgrade the regulations, but it's going very slow. Uh, I think we all, uh, the common desire in the room is that entrepreneurs have more room to innovate and to try new things 
in terms of taking care of patients, covering them with the proper insurance, and um, making our health healthcare system better. So thank you very much. We continue on that tomorrow for the whole day with a lot of other innovators, disruptors, and entrepreneurs.